Okay, so the very last section in chapter 2 is 2.5, which is this transformations of functions. And I went ahead and made a handout just because it's a lot of notes. Um, and a lot of it isn't that the notes themselves are hard. It's just that you have a lot of stuff to write down, a lot of new things to think about when we talk about transforming our functions. So... There is a handout. It is also available on the My Math Lab site if there's some of it you want to print off separately or you want to rework anything. This whole front page right here, there's nothing to work out. This is reference. In my notes, which is the same thing, just so you know, I have the exact same information on here. Um, actually, there's a little bit more information because with our graphs, it tells the domain, the range, where it's increasing, where it's decreasing, and whether it's an even, odd, or neither function. So all of that is great information to have. Um, it's a little extraneous in that when we go to transform our graphs around, we don't necessarily have to know all of that in order to know what we're doing with our graphs. But the basic functions, which are also found on page 129 of your textbook, or the ones that are pictured here on the front page of this handout, these are really important for you to memorize. Again, you don't have to memorize all the little data things, but memorizing that a y equals x, or f of x equals x, is a straight line. That absolute value functions look like v's. That quadratic functions look like u's. That square root functions look like swooshes. I call those a swoosh. Um, having a general picture of what these look like in your head is greatly going to help you as it comes time to graph these. Because transformations of functions is where we take these basic functions and we're going to move them and we're going to flip them and we're going to stretch them and we're going to do all this stuff to them. But we still need to have that general picture in our head of what these are supposed to look like. So strongly, strongly recommend memorizing I would say know your absolute value, know your quadratic, know your square root, your cubic, and this reciprocal function. We'll have a whole section on reciprocal functions later on in the semester. But those ones are pretty key, and those are going to be the ones that you're doing transformations with the most um, during this class. So these are your mother functions, as they are known. So I'm going to flip over to the next page, because that's actually where the notes begin. And I'll zoom in. So the first type of transformation that we are going to do is something called a vertical shift. A vertical shift or a vertical translation is where we take our basic function, which in this case is the slightly, it's hard to tell in black and white, but it's slightly darker we take our basic function and we're going to shift it up or we're going to shift it down. Nothing else changes. We just move the entire graph up or the entire graph down. And so what's being affected there is our y's. And we're going to shift it up c units if it says plus c after the function or we shift it down c units if it says it after the function. It's important to note that if it affects the y values of your function, it's always going to be tacked on outside of the function itself. And that'll make a little bit more sense here in a minute when you see the difference between a vertical shift and a horizontal shift and how they play out. The nice thing, though, about vertical shifts is they move in the direction you would think. So if it says plus c, you move up. If it says minus c, you move down. So for this first graph, notice they are labeled different. It says graph 1, graph 2, and we're going to put both of these things on graph 1. I just kind of was trying to maximize the paper space here. But for graph 1, we're going to graph f of x equals the absolute value of x and g of x equals the absolute value of x minus 4. So if you have colors and you want to use colors, you can. I'm going to use colors in hopes that it helps to differentiate which graph I'm doing where. Um, I do, on most of them in the notes, I have you include the mother function on the same graph so that you can see exactly what kind of transformation is happening. So if you know that the function of the absolute value of x looks like a v, 
then we can just draw that in and we can have that going. If you don't know what the function is supposed to look like, even at its most basic form, the way that you would have to approach this is you'd have to use those T charts where you pick some X's and you plug them in and figure out what the Y's are and you'd have to plot points, the point plotting method. And that can be really, really tedious. There's nothing wrong with it, but it does take more time. If you memorize what these basic functions look like, then you know, okay, we're going to start at 0, 0, then we go 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and negative 1, 1, negative 2, 2, negative 3, 3, and it's going to look like a V. This is what the basic f of x function looks like. Again, these don't have to be perfect, and on the My Math Lab page, it does a good job. Although I do remember you guys making fun of one of my graphs yet last time, so maybe they do have to be perfect. I don't know. So there's the mother function, the basic function. And then it wants us to graph our g of x, which is our mother function, minus 4. So notice here that the minus 4 is outside of the absolute value. That means this minus 4 is tacked on at the end, which tells you it's a vertical shift. And it's a vertical shift where we're moving everything down 4 units. So a lot of times I'll make a little note exactly what's going on with my translation so I know exactly what to do on my graph. And what I'm going to do and why I made you plot the mother function first is I'm going to take a few of the points and I'm just going to bring them down 4 units. I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. and then draw them in. Again, if you didn't know what this was supposed to look like, or if your problem didn't require you to draw the mother function in, you could always do the point plotting method, where I would say, okay, if I plug in zero here for my g of x, then what do I get out? Well, I get out negative four. And if I plug in one, what do I get out? Well, I get out negative three. And so on and so forth. But even if you don't know exactly what the mother function is supposed to look like, you, you are going to want to know a little bit about them because if I just start plotting points on this one versus, let's say, a quadratic, which is shaped like a U, I'm not going to know necessarily whether this is supposed to come to a point like a V or if it's supposed to be rounded like a U, like with the parabola. So again, you definitely want to memorize at least the general pictures of these mother functions. Are there any questions on how we did the vertical shift? We took the function, we shifted it down. It didn't affect our x's, it only affected our y's, because y's are the vertical change. Okay, so I'm going to slide down a little bit. I'll have to slide back up here in a minute, but to the horizontal shifts. That's the next translation that we're going to talk about, and this affects inside the function itself. So it's not tacked on at the end like it was with our vertical shift. Notice with our vertical shift, it says f of x plus c, and that plus c is outside of the f of x. Down here with our horizontal shift, it's f of x plus c. So that's inside of the function itself, which means it affects your x values because it's a horizontal shift. And it's going to move in the opposite direction of what you think. So when it says x plus c, you're actually moving to the left. You're moving towards the negative side. And when it says f of x minus c, you're going to move to the right. So vertical translations are always going to happen in the order you think. It's going to go up if they're positive, down if they're negative. Horizontals are the opposites. Okay? And this is what I meant, if you look at the example down here, we're dealing with our absolute value. And then we have the radical of x plus 5. Since that plus 5 is under the radical, we know it's going to be a horizontal shift. If it had said, this, then it's a vertical shift. So there is a difference. This is outside of the main function. g of x is inside the main function. 
So this is the difference. We're not going to graph h of x, but just wanted you to see this one's a vertical shift over here. And what these look like and how they are different. So again, we are going to graph the f of x function and the g of x function on the same graph. And the g of x function, since it says plus 5, are we going to move to the right 5 or to the left 5? Yep, it's going to move the opposite direction of what you think, so we're going to move everything to the left 5 units. So maybe you don't know what the um, function f of x equals the square root of x looks like. So you can go back to your front page. It's your swoosh. So notice it goes all the way to zero, but then it doesn't go any further, it doesn't come down, it doesn't go over anywhere. So that's what we're going to graph first on our graph two up here. We're going to graph our swoosh. And again, if you didn't know, we'd start plugging in some numbers. If we plug in zero, the square root of zero is zero. If you plug in one, the square root of one is one. If you plug in four, one, two, three, four, the square root of four is two. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 is 3. And then since we know that g of x is going to be a horizontal translation to the left 5 units, you can just move those dots, the points that you've already plotted, to the left 5 units. So instead of 0, 0, you're now at 0, ne or negative 5, 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 5, that's enough. When it comes to graphing on the My Math Lab site, what they have you do is you pick the graph um, that you're trying to graph first, so the absolute value of x. And then it's going to give you all these different boxes to fill in to tell it what kind of translation is going on. So you're not actually graphing the translation. You're going to graph the mother function, and then you're going to tell it that it has a vertical shift up to or down to, and then a horizontal shift to the left or whatever you're doing. When it comes to test days, because they are pencil and paper tests, this will be what you're encountering. Where you have a grid, most of the time I will have you put the mother function down as well. Um, just as a good reference. Questions, comments on vertical or horizontal shifts? Okay. Then let's do both. This time we're going to put three graphs, it looks like, on one thing because I make it nice and fun. So we're going to put the mother function, then we're going to put the function g of x, and then the function h of x. This is our quadratic function. This is going to look like a u. It starts at the origin at 0, 0. Then if you plug in 1, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4. and so on and so forth. It's rounded because it's you, like that. Now for g of x, what kind of translation are we doing? Do what? Yeah, it's a horizontal shift to the left one unit. So I'm going to make a little note of that above that. So I'm going to take everything I just graphed for g, or for the green one, which is my f of x, and I'm going to shift it to the left one unit. This is why having the mother function already graphed is kind of nice, because you don't have to do any computations. You're just moving everything over. Now, if we're going from g to h of x, what is the other translation that is being added on? Mm 
Yeah. Vertical translation. That minus 3 out there on the end is telling us we're going to move down. So if you were starting with the mother function, you would be moving to the left one unit, and you'd be moving down three units. But since we can start right there with our red function, our g of x, we can just take all of those points and drop them down three. And sometimes they'll overlap. And it gets a little messy, but that bottom one is the one for h of x. And in my handwritten notes, it might be a little easier to see because I do pencil versus red pen versus highlighted. And really, I broke that one down the way that I did. So you can see each of the individual translations that are going on and how we do each of them. In general, you do, you do your um, horizontal translations first, and then you do your vertical translations last. Questions on that one? Do you see how it looks inside the function itself so that we're able to tell apart what's going on horizontally versus vertically and how it's out here? These are never going to be like foiled out to where they're tricky like that. It's going to be pretty noticeable so that you can tell what the mother function is from the very beginning and then tell what the shifts or the translations are. Okay. Well, the next one is reflection about the x-axis. We actually kind of talked about this last time when we talked about even, odd, and neither. We talked about reflecting and symmetry and how if we fold our graph one way, it'll lay right on top of itself. And that's what's happening here when we reflect about the x-axis. That's where the graph of y equals negative f of x is the same as y equals f of x. So if we folded our graph from top to bottom, it would lay right on top of each other. This affects your y's. What is happening is you start with like x, y, and if you have a reflection about the x-axis, then what happens is you have x negative y. And again, we know it affects our y's because that negative sign is outside of our function itself. Just like with our vertical shifts, it was outside of the function. And that's always, if it affects the y's, it's always outside of the function. So we're going to graph two of these up here on graph four. The first one is the cube root of x, which again, if you're not 100% sure what that looks like, cube root, it looks like the cubic, but it's on its side. So let's make a little note that it's gonna look like this. It's like a swoosh and a half, double swoosh. Those are very mathematical terms, by the way, the swoosh and the double swoosh. And then the g of x means we're going to flip it. So instead of everything that's on top, that's now going to be on bottom. And everything that's on bottom is now going to be on top. So what's going to happen is you're going to end up with something like this. So let's graph that mother function first. So if I take the cube root of 0, I get 0. If I take the cube root of 1, I get 1. If I take the cube root of 8, I get 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then I do the negative, because if I take the cube root of negative 1, I get negative 1. And the cube root of negative 8... I get negative 2. And when we reflect then about the x-axis, the things that are on top go down to the bottom, and the things that are on bottom go up to the top, because what we're doing is we are negating our y's. 
we are changing our y value. So I even had that in my notes and didn't put them on here. So negate the y's. So instead of being at 1, 1, I'm now going to be at 1, negative 1. And instead of at 8, 2, I'm going to be at 8, negative 2. Which makes kind of a really neat symmetric little graph thing whenever we put the mother function and the translated function on the same graph. So when we reflect about the x-axis, we change our y's. So what do you think happens when we reflect about the y-axis? Yeah, our x's change. So when we reflect about the y-axis right here, notice the negative is inside the function. And if it's inside the function, it affects the x's. So what happens is we have x, y with our main function, and then it becomes negative x, y. We negate our x's. So that's like folding our graph vertically like this, where everything that's on the right goes to the left, and everything that's on the left goes to the right. And we're going to graph our swoosh function. And then we're going to graph our reflected swoosh. Do we have any questions at all about any of these first four translations that we've learned? Vertical shifting, horizontal shifting, reflecting about the x-axis, or reflecting about the y-axis? All right, let's keep going. The next one is vertical stretching and shrinking. That's where we're going to think about grabbing our graph and pulling it up or taking our graph and smooshing it down. Okay? So in this case, what's going to happen is you're going to have a coefficient out in front of your function because we're shifting vertical. And so again, if it's shifting vertical, it's outside of the function itself. And so if your C this constant out front, is greater than 1, then what's going to happen is you are going to be stretched. It's going to make your graph get bigger. And if your C is between 0 and 1, then it's going to smoosh it. Because if you're between 0 and 1, what happens is you are a fraction of some kind, so then instead of growing, you are cutting things in half or in force and things like that. And again, because this is vertical and because that constant is outside, then what happens is this is affecting our y's. And what you can think of and what you can do in this case, the little note that I like to add over here to the side, is when you are doing vertical stretching and shrinking, you are multiplying your y values by whatever c is. And that doesn't matter if C is greater than 1 or if C is between 0 and 1. You're going to multiply your Y values by C. Your X's do not change. 
because we're either going to stretch upward or we're going to smush downward, but it's not going to change anything horizontally. And some of you may be looking at that and thinking, okay, but what happens when we have C is negative? Well, then what you're actually doing is two different translations. What you're doing is you're doing the translations we just talked about because we're reflecting at that point. We would be reflecting about the x-axis, that's where the negative comes in, after we've done a stretch. And I'll go ahead and tell you that while you can do that, I'm not that mean to put like every single translation possible in a single graph because it just gets to be tedious. Um, most of the time what we end up using are vertical and horizontal shifts, um, some minor reflections every once in a while. But we don't usually do every single one of these all at once. But you should be able to if it came to it. Oh, I guess I included that in your notes, I'm sorry. Multiply your y's by c. All right, so nice big graph. We're going to do three graphs on this one. We're going to graph our main function, which is the absolute value of x. Then we're going to see what happens if we have a vertical stretch by 2 versus a horizontal stretch or shrink by a half. Horizontal. I said horizontal. Vertical. Both of these are vertical. But one of them is going to cause it to grow upward twice as fast, and one of them is going to cause it to grow upward half as fast. But we're going to start with our main mother function, which is our v starting at 0, 0. Now for g of x, it says 2 times the absolute value of x. So what that means is, is like, let's say x is 1. If x is 1 in the mother function, that means I go to 1. But in g of x, I'm going to have 2 times 1, which means it's going to go to 2. And when x is 2, that's going to be 2 times 2, which is 4. And when it's 3, it's going to be 6. So it's growing a lot faster. It makes our graph actually thinner in this case because it's going upward faster. It still starts at zero, zero. But my y's are growing twice as fast. And so I took my green function and I'm stretching it upward because my c in this case is greater than 1. For my h of x function, though, it's not going to do that because it is between 0 and positive 1. So it is a shrink or a smoosh to where when x is 1, I'm at 1 half. And when x is 2, I'm at 1. And when x is 3, I'm at 3 halves. And when x is 2, or at 4, then I'm at 2. So notice that it takes a lot longer for my graph to actually like grow up, in a sense. So you get a smushed graph, or a shrunk graph. I think of it more as smushed than shrunk. Because it's almost like you put something heavy on our green graph and it's smooshing it out to where it fans out more instead of going up more. Questions on vertical stretching or shrinking, on how this works. Again, know that if it came to a test day, or if it comes to your quiz and you're looking at it and you're like, man, I have no idea what's going on here, you can always check or do your point plotting method. 
You can always make your T-charts and pick a whole bunch of X's and see what you get out and then be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I am smushing it or I am translating it over. Um, so worst case scenario, that's always like a backup that you have. Obviously, as we progress and as we are doing these problems, if that's always what you rely on, then it takes a lot longer to do. But definitely not a problem to use, especially in the beginning. Okay. If we did vertical stretching and shrinking, logic would say the next one is horizontal stretching and shrinking. So this is where instead of stretching up and down or shrinking up and down, we're going to do that side to side. So with horizontal stretching and shrinking, we're not touching our Y's. We're only dealing with our X's. And as it says right here, instead of multiplying by C, what we're doing is we are dividing our X's by C. And these are a little bit different, kind of like with our horizontal shifts. If it said negative C, then we move to the right C. And if it said positive C, we move to the left C, which was counterintuitive. The same thing's true here. If C is greater than 1, then what we're actually doing is we are shrinking our graph. We are shoving it closer and closer together. And if C is a fraction between 0 and 1, then what's happening is we are stretching. And that comes from the fact that we are dividing our x's by the C. And notice the difference here. We have y equals f of Cx, so the C, that constant, is inside of the function itself. That's how we know it's horizontal. Vertical looks like f, or there's C out here outside of it. Vertical always has your constants outside. Horizontal always deals with your constants inside. Okay. Now this one's a little bit different in that it gives us a graph. We don't get a general function. It's not one of our mother functions. They're giving us a graph with some information on it, and we're going to use that information to graph our stretched and our shrunk versions. So if I need to do g of x, which is f of 2x, notice that our c in this case is 2, which is greater than 1, which means we're going to actually be shrinking. We are dividing all of our x's by that c. Divide x's, in this case, by 2. So that means that this first point over here, instead of being negative or 0, is going to be what? Yeah, negative 2, 0. So on my graph, I'm going to go over to negative 2, 0, and I'm going to plot it. And then I'm going to move along to the next point that they give me, which is negative 2, 4. Again, my y's are not changing, so I'm just looking at the x. And if I'm dividing my x by 2, that'll give me negative 1, 4. And then luckily 0, 0 doesn't change. So there's the left-hand side of that picture, it's just this little bump. Then I move along, and I'll have 2, negative 2. If I divide that 2 by 2, then I get 1, negative 2. Go over to 4, 0, becomes 2, 0. So then I get my little v over on the right. I feel like you don't get the full picture because your shrunken graph is not laying right on top of the original graph. Um, I guess theoretically you could come over here and do it on the side. But we took everything and we smushed it in. And so what's going to happen then for our h of x function? What happens? What happens when you divide x's by 1 half? What happens when you divide by a fraction? Yeah, you flip it and multiply it. So what we are actually doing is we are multiplying our x's by 2, which means that we are stretching it. So instead of negative 4, 0, we're going to be out here at negative 8, 0. And then negative 4... 4, 
and then zero, zero, that one doesn't change. And then four, negative two, and eight, zero. So then we're stretching that graph all the way out. So they can give you like a, a different function that's not one of your mother functions that you're going to have to manipulate around. When they do that though, they're always going to give you like on this graph, we had five main points that we could move around. Um, on a test, if I gave you something like that, it would be similar to what we just did. On your my math lab, if it gave you something where it wasn't in terms of a mother function, then most of the time, at least as far as I know, it's always multiple choice where they will show you like four or six or eight different graphs and you pick which one it is that's been translated correctly. Questions on horizontal stretching and shrinking. Okay. Um, the next thing on your notes packet is just the, like the next problem. But really what is next in your notes should be this next page, which I printed off separately instead of doing it all together. In my notes in here, I put it here, um, but I really like the table. I know it's going to be crooked, or I can't see all of it, so let me zoom out a little bit. I really liked this general table where it shows all of the translations that you could encounter. It tells you what's going on and it tells you how you're changing the mother function. I just thought that was a very helpful way to have everything all in one spot. The order of transformations is really the next thing where it tells you if you have multiple transformations all in one equation, what do you do first? It's kind of like your order of operations. First, you're going to do any horizontal shifting. Then you do any stretching or shrinking. And that's whether it's horizontal or vertical. It doesn't matter. You're going to do all, any of that next. You do your reflecting. And the last thing you do is your vertical shifting. And so the reason why I made this separate and not attached to the other is because you might want to have this out to reference when you're doing your homework or your quizzes. Or when we flip over to the next page, I thought it would be helpful to have this out to the side instead of attached somewhere in your notes packet. And so that's the reason why I separated those two. Because in the notes packet, there's actually just one more problem. Because it's a big one. And I gave four different graphs because I want to put one transformation on each graph so you can see how everything is moving around. And so what we're going to do is in this first graph up here, we're going to start with the mother function. We're going to start with f of x equals x squared. That is our parabola, which starts at 0, 0, goes 1, 1, 2, 4... One, two, three, four, three, nine. I think that's ten. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep, that's the wrong one. And one, two, two. So this is like our starting point. We're going to start here, and then we're going to use this information plus the transformations they're telling us to move around and get our other graphs. So if we look at g of x, we have 2 times x plus 3 quantity squared minus 1. Do we have any horizontal shifting in our transformations? Yes, we do, because in here is where our horizontal shifting happens. And that's telling us what? Which way are we going, right or left? Left. left. We're going to go left three units. So in the next graph, I'm just going to shift everything to the left three units. I'm just going to take this one step at a time.
So we went here by shifting to the left three units. On our order of transformations, the next one would be to look for any stretching or shrinking. So do we have any vertical or horizontal stretching or shrinking? Well, if it was horizontal stretching or shrinking, then we would have like a number in here in front of our X, which we don't. So there's definitely no horizontal stretching or shrinking. We do have a number out here though. And if it's out here, then this tells us we have a vertical stretch or shrink. Okay, so that means we're going to multiply all of our Y's by 2. And that's what we're going to do on our next one. So this tells me vertical stretch multiplied by 2. I just like to make little notes so I know what I'm doing. So I'm going to shift down. You can go in whatever, if it makes sense to go clockwise, you go clockwise. If you like to go right to left, or excuse me, left to right and then left to right, you do that. I'm going to go straight down and keep going clockwise. Multiply y's by 2. So here, and I'm going to be at 1, 2, 3, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. But then instead of being at negative 2, 1, I'm now going to be at negative 2, 2. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. And then instead of being at negative 4, 1, I'm going to be at negative 4, 2. And instead of being at negative 1, 4, I'm now going to be at negative 1, 8. 10, 9, 8. So you notice it starts growing quite a bit quicker. Like our graph gets a lot skinnier in this third picture than it did in our previous two, and that's because we're stretching it upward. Maybe that doesn't show as well. But there, if we zoom out, you can see that this one's quite a bit skinnier than our other ones. And it's because we stretched it upward. We did a vertical stretch. So we've dealt with almost all of the numbers up there in our original g of x function. We had 2 times the x plus 3 quantity squared and we have this minus 1 tacked on here at the end. What does that minus 1 tell us to do? Yep, we're going to have a vertical shift down one unit. So when we go from this graph that we just did, we're going to take everything and just shift it down one more unit. So that's kind of, the reason why I split this one up, which I will not expect you to do on a test or anything like that, but the reason why I did split it up is so that you can see each individual translation and what is happening in our graph. Um, when it comes to a test, you're going to go straight from maybe the mother function to the end graph, or it's just going to give you this graph and ask you to graph it by itself. It's not going to ask you to show every single step along the way. And if you are struggling with what kind of translation is actually going on, then from the very beginning with this g of x function, you could have set up your t-chart and plotted your points. You could have picked a whole bunch of x values um, to test out where those are going to be. The one thing I would like caution you on is if you're going to go and rely on the point plotting system at all, even if it's a backup check, you have to be careful because look at what our final graph looked like. If I chose zero and some positive numbers and only like two negative numbers, I'm not getting a very good picture of what's going on with my graph. 
And so I still need to have in my mind what this should look like in the end so I don't just plot this one point and that one point and think, oh, well, I have a line and then a line and then obviously I'm wrong. Um, so I would use the t-charts and the point plotting method more as a check than as a actual way to do your graphing.